Oh, well, hello, this is uh, Dr. Paul Alexander, and I have the great pleasure and honor once again to speak to Dr. Mike Eden. And uh, this, this, this uh, video will be pretty short. And um, we want to discuss, and I want to get Dr. Eden's views on this admission and this that, that is in the media, the reports that the uh, Pfizer executive admitted or stated that uh, Pfizer did not get to test or study transmission of the um, of the COVID gene injection that they produce, whether the capacity of it to stop transmission. Now, one thing I want to say up front is this, that, that we know from the data on the epidemiology today, based on, on what has happened across countries, that this gene injection does not stop transmission, does not stop replication, does not even stop infection in the first place. Now, Dr. Yeen, as an expert, could help pass that the reporting because because uh, so much was said in that short piece so i would like to hear his point of view please thank you dr yeah, Ethan, yeah. You. you can give up uh, just say what your background was in sure. one sentence yes i was i was formerly worldwide head of respiratory research at pfizer and, and my training prior to that included a phd in uh, a study of the respiratory system and opiates so sure. um yeah so you are right paul the Pfizer executive in response to questioning at some EU inquiry. I, I saw some videotapes yesterday. Um, although it's a little bit unclear exactly what phrase she used, we know, because we've studied the uh, filings of clinical trials, that Pfizer did not study uh, to see if there was any impact on transmission uh, when they're looking at their COVID-19 vaccines. They just looked at the count of whether people became PCR positive or not. And as you know, even that is in question. There are uh, accusations of clinical trials fraud. I've spoken to Brooke Jackson about that, and she's involved in a court case. So that aside, they definitely didn't study uh, transmission. Um, but it's important It's important that people would know something Something else as a background. They, the whole That's idea true. that these injected vaccines could stop transmission, we, we know that wasn't true at least in the vulnerable population, uh, because we have a decade or more worth of data with injected vaccines for influenza. And we know, unfortunately, they do not stop hospitalization or death from flu. There are um, Cochrane reports uh, in the UK and also uh, an equivalent report in the US, and they literally don't work, which is shocking to me. It's only during the COVID era that I've gone to look. But if you're being offered flu vaccines, don't bother. They actually don't work. Injected vaccines do not prevent um, airway infection or airway illnesses that are assumed to be due to viruses. They don't work. And so I will tell you, and I knew this a long time ago in, in 2020, the proposition that we should wait while pharmaceutical industry made a vaccine was a fraudulent way to tackle this pandemic. It should always have been uh, early treatment of people who presented with illness. That, and that's always what uh, my, my friends who are physicians have said. They should never have said, wait, wait for a vaccine because an injected vaccine wasn't going to work. Um, but then we've got another problem later in 2021. Independent academic research showed comparing vaccinated people with unvaccinated people who were then apparently ill and had these positive PCR tests. So we're really saying... COVID-19 cases in vaccinated and unvaccinated patients had the same peak viral load, the same cycle threshold for positive PCR tests. In other words, the peak level of virus in the airway was the same, whether they'd been vaccinated or not. And that told me that damn, the damn vaccines don't work at all. They don't prevent infection. They didn't prevent the viral load apparently reaching the same peak. And of course, it would be illogical to expect a reduction in transmission since you would think transmission arises from having lots of virus in the airway. So uh, they never had any data. They never had any data, the authorities, no data whatsoever, nor any reason to believe that they would reduce transmission. And therefore, insisting that people would be jabbed to keep their jobs or their liberty was always fraudulent. There was never any scientific basis for it. There were no claims that it would happen. We knew that it shouldn't happen based on prior art. And quite quickly, they knew the same year in 2021 that they did not reduce transmission. So, you know, you can decide at which point you want to call a halt. I, I didn't. I thought mandates were 
were inappropriate at any point, even on the idea of protecting your neighbor. Yes, so 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 Dr. Eden, then you know it brings me back, you know, I I I, I should have pulled up these studies, but there was a study by um I recall because I, I wrote on these Shikrit at Al in uh, Israel, one by Hati Maki in Finland, and then one in Ho Chi Minh City by Chow et al that showed that um nosocomial outbreaks in those three countries, yeah, when nurses who were double vaccinated in Delta, in yes. the era of Delta to pre-Omicron, where they were even fully PPE'd and masked, they all double vaccinated when the index nurses got infected in those three countries, Israel, yeah. Finland, and Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. They all spread the virus to all of the other nurses and patients. Yes. It showed us that the PP didn't work. But in other words, you are saying, and what it showed us is that the vaccinated nurses had, they reported the same viral load as yes. the unvaccinated nurses. Yes. So I, you, know, you, you do know that, Paul, that I, I have a, a different view now of, of viruses and transmission that I did at the beginning. So at the moment, I'm talking as if the virus narrative is correct. So with that in parenthesis, then I, I agree with what you just said, that there is no evidence that even after given full vaccines, that yes. the, the, the patients that were PCR positive were as likely to, to spread this phenomenon to their to their colleagues. So it was doing nothing. You know, the jazz nothing. were doing nothing, the PP was nothing. doing nothing, nothing, nothing. The whole thing is, has been, I would say, a macabre uh, game really that yeah, yeah. the authorities have played a macabre game with people's heads and their lives for the last two and a half years with no yes, good yeah. evidence with no good evidence yes so that so that in other words in other words the the inability for these gene injections to prevent infection in the first place yeah. really extrapolates to the point well if they don't prevent infection of course they're not going to have a role in preventing transmission yes i think i think that would be, that would be fair and I, I am keen to add that uh, for those who watch other recordings, so what Paul said is correct. You know, if the if the vaccine narrative is correct, little particles landing in the airway, the antibodies that you would generate from an injected vaccine would not stop that those viruses, those particles landing and infecting you. And the reason is the antibodies that these vaccines generate circulate in the blood, uh, IgM, IgG. They're simply not secreted into the airway mucosa, they're not there to intercept the invader. Um, and antibodies don't really get readily into lung tissue. So I would not expect them to prevent infection or multiplication of the virus, and they appear not to. But as I say, I, I've looked at, um, you may have looked at it yourself, but if not, I would encourage you to, to look at the work of Dennis Rancourt in Canada. Mm -hmm. And he's looked at all cause mortality week by week in all 50 states by, by, by sex, uh, and age, and, and un unfortunately, or for the narrative, it's very, it's very embarrassing, but it's very important people know this, that the typical winter pattern of excess mortality with, by influenza-like illnesses, that's what they're called, assumed to be viruses, but known as ILI or influenza-like illnesses, generally, well, every year they rise in what's called a super proportional way. The older you are, much greater your risk of not making it through the winter after encountering one of these influenza-like illnesses. And that pattern of increasing mortality, super proportional with age, marking the winter, winter excess deaths, is considered characteristic of these ILIs. Well, unfortunately, um, Rancourt's data does not show that pattern in the in the spring of 2020 or at any other time and i'm afraid having looked at it and i'm a scientist not a clinician i i can't get to any other conclusion other than the excess deaths that, that arose at least in america are not due to the spreading of a novel, novel pathogen so if a, if a virus exists it's not the one that's killing people it might be showing up in some sort of test but the cause of the excess mortality in the in the US, it's not consistent with all prior, prior influenza-like illnesses. And so I have to say, Paul, I think they I think the authorities have lied to us about literally absolutely everything, including the emergence of a new virus. I don't I don't even think that story is true. I think they've lied to us artfully, all the way from Wuhan, uh, bad PCR testing. Uh, and then inappropriate measures like masking, lockdown, 
social distancing, border closures, mass testing, all of it's been uh, uh, a fraud. All of it's been a, a horrible, deliberate drama. And we've mostly fallen for it. Most people were frightened or still are frightened. And I think there's no new hazard in the environment other than our government's policies. Because, as you know, as a clinician, the treatment of patients in hospital has been scandalous with uh, 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 premature, inappropriate ventilation, mechanical ventilation, which is very dangerous. And if people have an open airway and they're still conscious and breathing, you should support their oxygenation. You shouldn't sedate them and start ventilating them. They were also given intravenous drugs that were not effective and quite dangerous, like remdesivir. And around the world, we see inappropriate use in non-terminal patients of midazolam and morphine. Uh, and I'm certainly my country, UK, that was responsible for thousands and thousands of deaths. So the bottom line is I don't think there's ever been a new hazard other than our government's policies. And uh, it's all been a macabre game. Uh, and I believe the drug companies and senior public health people uh, knew what was going on. I'm not sure the doctors did. I'm not sure very many politicians did. But the senior most public health people and the drug companies, senior people, definitely knew what they were doing um, and very few other people apart from you know unfortunate people like me as I say I'm a scientist and I piece together the facts and that's the conclusion I've come to no one has yet come back to me to say you're wrong because so that's so, my position so, so but yeah certainly the EU politicians are right to be incandescent because they they thought what they were being sold was an injection that would provide uh, immunity ahead of infection to people and that would protect them um, and that would also prevent uh, the spreading of this pathogen and neither of those things are true so they I do see them getting cross and I encourage them to get belligerent and then get legal they should get legal with these companies Paul yes you, you know uh, Dr Yin my, my point has always been I've been out on the open saying that I want these people properly investigated all yeah. of them made all of these policy decisions and did this and uh, properly investigated and tried in proper legal forums, not as any um, crazy kangaroo situation, but proper. But if shown, if it is verified and shown that their actions were reckless and dangerous and costed lives, I want people held accountable. I, I, I really don't care what level or how connected you are in society. Yes. Uh, this is not a mere culpa because Dr. Yeadon, the, the, the issue is from... From two weeks after this began, February, March of 2020, we were getting so much of data and information coming from across the world and informing everyone, all FDA, CDC. But it was as though they were not even following the science. They were averse yes. to the science and they would not listen to us. No, they wouldn't listen. And it seemed to me, like you, like you say, Paul, that they were on transmit. They would only broadcast what they intended people to hear, and that would be reported by the media. But as new information poured in, they were not paying any attention. So I, I would point out to people that a standard understanding of these viruses uh, for decades has been um, that you need to be symptomatic to be a good source of virus. And that's why your grandma and your mother would have said, cover your mouth when you cough, Michael, you know, use a handkerchief or look away. We've known this forever. So even if transmission was when you're symptomatic and that makes you cough, you know. So what I'm saying is people who were not symptomatic, there was never any, never any purpose served in locking them down and keeping them away from each other. There's no magic here. Nothing new happens. They just lied to us about the idea that you could, or you could kill granny, you know, even though you were symptom free, that the idea that you could give your illness that you haven't got to somebody else, that was absurd. And we all knew that in March 2020, yes. uh, and, but it, and it seemed to me no matter how many conversations you had with, with doctors or politicians, they were they had their fingers in their ears and they were on one path. And the path was lockdown, uh, wait for vaccines, roll your sleeve up. And that's what they've been doing for getting on for three years. And uh, I feel immensely frustrated and, well, um, I think like most people full of bloody agony and just the, the suffering all around us for no good reason. There hasn't been a massive public health threat. Even if what they told us was true, the measures taken were inappropriate. And even if what they told us was true, 
uh, these gene-based injections couldn't have worked and were demonstrably ineffective. And then, as you know, Paul, we haven't talked about that. And we won't today, maybe. But but we some of us knew they were not likely to be safe either. So yes. this is it compounding the the problem of what are you doing, you know, public health people? What are you doing? This is crazy. When 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 the first um, gene-based product injections were coming up to the market, I, I was frantic and with. Dr. Wolfgang Vodag, we, we wrote open letters to the EMA saying, these are not a safe design and you've not done a good enough job of evaluating their, their safety and tox profile. We're worried you will see you know, massive injuries. And within months, um, that's exactly what was happening. By the spring of 2021, we were really in tears. We, we, we were fairly sure we would see blood clots because of expressing uh, pro-thrombotic uh, spike proteins. And that's what's happened. Billions of people have been injected. You know, if I told you I've got a material which I'll inject it into people and it'll make their bodies make a, a material that will prompt blood clots. And you'd probably say, well, you know, you're crazy. You need to be locked up. Well, that's what I saw the drug companies doing. So in addition to all this rubbish about not preventing transmission, uh, um, in addition, and um, quite separately, you know, um, or in parallel with, with those claims, They've moved forward with materials whose very design could not but produce side effects and then went ahead and did it. My only uncertainty is at the time was I didn't know how bad it would be. I could no one could know that. But but I would say I, I've said it that by design, these were not safe materials. And so they don't work, folks. If you listen to me, they don't work. We were pretty sure they wouldn't. And they, they and they were of a design that you would expect to be dangerous, and they have so proven. So, you know, call me a conspiracy theorist, but for God's sake, don't take any more of these, and please, please persuade your friends and relatives not to expose themselves to any more. And like Paul, we have to find a way of holding um, some senior people to account. I know it's difficult, and I don't know how to do it, but there are certain people uh, in the FDA, certain people in the CDC. Uh, a couple of named individuals in uh, medicines regulators in the UK, uh, very senior public health advisors in the UK, and we could we could come up with a list of maybe a dozen names. Someone needs to go and arrest these people peace, peacefully, and so we can actually lay a charge sheet at their door. And then if they're if they're innocent, they and their lawyers will be able to defend themselves, but they won't be able to defend themselves because they have done indefensible things for years. Um, and someone's got to be properly taken down and be seen to be treated correctly and and i think that would collapse it there's no good at all of us trying to say well all our public health officials should be called to account so i think some uk and us people i would vote for that i think they've been i think us and uk have been the most influential and they should there are a few people like fauci and walensky um you know pat valance um Chris Whitty uh, and June Rain in the MHRA. I think six people I would like to see arraigned on legal charges because the things they know what I know. I, I'm not spectacularly knowledgeable. I had the same kind of education in the UK health system they did and through the same period. So our foundational courses in immunology, microbiology would all be the same. And that's mostly what I've used. I haven't had to use advanced pharmaceutical company skills. Some of that in the critical analysis of the design yes but in terms of the fundamentals um i would say my first year undergraduate courses the same as they had provided me with sufficient information to navigate they know that they know they're doing wrong there's no possibility that they've made mistakes they've they've done things they shouldn't have i've no idea why we'll have to ask them yeah and uh, and i think you know so we uh we we, we wouldn't take too long today but i just wanted to get you on uh to hear your yeah. view on, 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 on that situation. But, you know, to end here, Dr. Yin, we have this situation now where they are pushing to, um, we've heard of, of additional funding for EcoHealth Alliance and these people to conduct more research with these coronaviruses, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, we now see that they're going after um, children with these, uh, with these boosters when, I mean, the, the, the head advisor to the Biden administration, his name is Dr. Shish Ja. He came on in news yesterday and said he's so glad and happy that the FDA approved and he's going to make sure his 10-year-old son got a booster. And I mean, 
using his podium to me was very responsible and reckless. Yeah. He could yeah. not have said that to the public. You make that decision privately to yourself. You but, yes. but I don't know any science that show, once his son is healthy, that shows that a 10 year old, I mean, we looked at all of the studies and the data, Dr. Yin, yeah. and yeah. not one healthy child in America That's correct. died. Yep. From I COVID agree with COVID. you. Not, not a thing. In fact, interestingly, uh, even immunocompromised children, there was a study in Britain of children who had had some immune compromise. And if that was their only medical problem, even they did not get ill and die, not one. So healthy children, um, there's health, healthy people, <laughs> but certainly healthy minors, if we want to just restrict it to that, there's, it is not indicated. These injections are not indicated in healthy uh, people under 18, uh, because on no occasions have they acquired this illness and died. They, they, so there's nothing to protect them against, folks. Nothing to protect them against. There's no public health hazard that puts your child at risk. Do not, please do not, allow them to be injected by these materials, which I am confident are toxic and, and are not very old anyway, but they're not, they're not safe. There's no possibility of a benefit because they're not at risk without treatment. They've got very good immune systems, and the and the evidence is that I don't know more than ninety percent of them appear to have, you know, evidence of immune reactions. So that means they've been exposed. They, you know, whoever they've whatever this material is, whatever the challenge was, it's been and gone, and they've they've surfed it completely fine. So I agree with you, Paul. It's it's frightening that. You know, it's like a never-ending nightmare. I thought, well, at least they've got through it now. They're going to have to change gear, do something else. But they keep coming. Um, yeah. <laughs> they keep coming uh, for babies and children. And I'm afraid that the numbers may not be very large, uh, but healthy young children and babies are dying. You know, hundreds, it's probably hundreds, if not thousands, around the world. Um, and it's indefensible because these children are not exposed. They're not at risk from whatever this illness is. It's as simple yeah. as that. Public health officials are lying to you. They're lying to you. Their motives might be money. They might be some kind of philosophy that I don't understand, but it's not based on truth, and I don't think you should pay attention to it. Well, you know, you said it exactly how I'm thinking about it. That, that You see, the thing is, we don't want, and I think people like yourself, myself, we read a lot, we listen, we try mm. to educate ourselves every day on new stuff. Because yeah. education is lifelong, but mm -hmm. something is staggering here. It doesn't make yeah. sense. Yes. And it's not, it's not, they're doing things not based on any sort of science and and they're not stopping. No, it's they, shocking. It, it is shocking. And I again I have speculated that uh I, I you know I've said before that I, I think this is a control agenda, and that's yeah. the only way it makes sense is if it's a control agenda, then it doesn't need to be scientifically correct. It just needs to frighten people into compliance. So I, I put out a letter a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, that said, if you can suspend this belief and just imagine for a, for a couple of minutes, maybe a whole day, uh, adopt my mindset, which is that unfortunately, your government is not benign, but is intent on harming you then it makes sense. Uh, and I'm afraid I think that's what's happened. They want to they want to inject people and most people are rewarded. It's a rather poor reward, but they're basically, they're given a digital ID, essentially. If you're vaccinated, you get a digital ID. Uh, and I believe there's lots of evidence for this that some of the UN 2030 goals involve every human being on the planet ha having a unique digital ID and their lives thereafter being based on permissions uh, by presenting this digital ID. So I do think one way of, of compelling us to do that is to lie about pandemics and get people to roll up for an injection. And then each person that rolls up gets an individual barcode, essentially, or a QR code, and they will carry that for life. Um, and they, I don't know how many, Paul, is it 4 billion people or 6 billion people on the planet? Um, it's a lot of people. It's billions now. Billions and billions have been injected at least once. So they're not far. They're not far from their goal. And uh, since most people are not vulnerable to whatever this is, and there are definitely risks associated with being injected by these gene-based products, my my strongest, you know, two things I urge you. One is just stop today. Stop following th this kind of macabre game. And, and then second, you need to be looking looking to the people who've, 
been imposing this on us and grappling, basically wrestling to the, them to the ground legally as soon as possible, because that, I think that's the only way of, I don't know how to do it, but we have to, these people have to be brought to account. Somebody does. And, you know, even if they are exhibition charges, there are some people who are very seriously involved. You know, Fauci, there's no question he's been very involved. And again, uh, uh, some of the people in the strategic advisory group in the UK, you know, Valance and Witty, being on, on the telly, you know, they were on the TV daily early on through the pandemic and then all the way through the run up into vaccination and thereafter. So those people have become, uh, shall we say, guests of almost every citizen of the world. And, and they, their messages, um, I think, have, uh, have played a, an important part in getting people to go along with what is this macabre game, which I think leads to loss of freedom. So that's why we need to stop them. Yes, yes, no, I, you know, uh, Dr. Eden, I, I, um, I agree with a lot of maybe basically everything that you've said, and um, it's what is very frightening, and uh, why people like yourself, myself, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dr. Reish, Dr. McCullough, etc., why we cannot stop. We have to keep yeah. making sure that the public is informed and sharing as much as we can, and to try and get on as much programs because. The legacy media is, is working over uh, uh, excess hours to make sure that we are canceled. But we are getting the word out there. And I'll end by saying this, two things. One, the fact that recent Kaiser research, et cetera, is showing that only about 4% of the population have taken the boosters, number yes. one. Good. And about 2% of parents, just 2% have gone for these uh, since the FDA approval in their children, which is good news. Yeah, yeah. I mean, zero would be a better number, but two percent, two percent is very low because I think in people my age, I'm sixty-two, so people older than me in, in the UK, it's over ninety percent have had at least two injections. So yeah, it, zero is a good number, but two percent is a relief because they don't need these things and they are hazardous. So please, folks, take care of your children and talk to each, talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. E, let me just say this in one or two minutes. Can you can you tie it up and say, give a message out to the people in your esteemed expertise uh -huh. now? Your 50,000 foot level today, wow. everything you yes. know. Yes. So I would say, if there ever was a novel public health emergency, if it's definitely gone now, there is nothing circulating in your environment that should you be that you should be frightened of except your government's responses your government is not behaving properly their public health function has failed and we need to be uh taking back our own lives talking to each other more not being shy about the questions we have and and just stop believing the nonsense that we're getting through essentially tabloid journalism on the television all the time so look around you realize that there is no evidence of, of some harms. The younger you are and the healthier you are, the, the less you ever needed to listen to these messages. Stop taking these injections. They're, they're not effective and they're not safe. And whenever you're next given a frightening message from your public health people and your government, you should ask lots of questions because they have shown themselves capable of lying mercilessly to us. And I think this is the worst, probably the worst case in history. Thank you, Dr. Eden. As soon as I load it up, I, I'm, I'm not editing it. I'm sending it as it is. I'll send it to you for you to put it out. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Alexander. Thank you. Thank for... you very much, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.